Welcome to The Great Podcast, a show where we take a look at the important men and women of history and decide once and for all if they are worth all of the fuss. My name is Jordan. And my name is David. That was a really good one. You know, the, it's going to be a running theme that you just struggle with the intro until eventually you don't. Yeah, how and you it actually works. did really well that time. Well done. And welcome to the show, guys. We have a, a an exciting one today because I mentioned briefly last week that today we're going to talk about the year of the four emperors dun 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 it's not usually a great time when a year has four different ultimate rulers I right think. yeah so there's there's something interesting if you if you want to see the stability of rome over time just mm-hmm. look up how many emperors there were per century that makes sense it's like eight in the first century and then like 10 or so in yeah. the second and then like 50 yeah well in the third. <laughs> it's probably hard to keep things going properly yeah. when you keep switching who's in charge it yeah and civil wars really mess things up but we'll talk about that today so uh we're gonna open with a quote from tacitus that i think kind of sums up what's gonna happen quite nicely Although Nero's death had at first been welcomed with outbursts of joy, it roused varying emotions, not only in the city among the senators and people and the city soldiery, but also among all the legions and generals. For the secret of empire was now revealed, that an emperor could be made elsewhere than at Rome. So now all the soldiers are going... We have the pointy things. I mean, we can just take the power. What if we made an emperor? (laughs) It, it is kind of wild to think that uh, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero all mm-hmm. came to power with little issue. There right. were assassinations, mm-hmm. sure, mm-hmm. but the next person in line like quickly became the emperor. There was never a battle over it. There right. was no It wasn't like question. a vacancy that needed to be fought over. Right. So that's not the case anymore because Nero didn't have children and everyone hated Nero. Well, right. not everyone. A lot well, of people hated Nero. Yeah. So Nero is dead. And you'll maybe remember that Galba had been named emperor actually before Nero died. Mm -hmm. He was declared by the Senate and everything. So let's take a quick look at Galba. So he was an old man. He was born in the BCs. Oh, okay. Was proclaimed emperor in 68 CE. So he's around 70. That's the end of an emperor's reign. Yes. Usually. (laughs) Typically. Uh, That means, bear this in mind, he has been alive for every single Roman emperor. Yeah. 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 He was uh, 17 when Augustus died. That's pretty wild. Yeah. And then, so he served under Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Mm. and Nero. It's wild. He has seen the entirety of the first Roman dynasty, and now he's going to be the one to end it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Last week, I named, just without telling you, three of the four emperors. So I'm curious if any of these are going to ring a bell to you. You know Galba already. so Heard of him from last week. Right. That's what I mean. That's one of the three Uh that I mentioned, and the fourth one has not been named at all. So let's take a look at what led Galba to this point. So he climbed the entirety of the political ladder through his long career. He was consul during Tiberius' reign. Uh, Then he was with Caligula when he went on his daring campaign into Germania. Uh, He impressed Caligula so much, fighting no one because Caligula didn't have a battle at all, (laughs) that Caligula put him in charge of the Rhine legions. Now, these are historically the best legions because they're always fighting those damn Germans who are trying to cross the Rhine. So the toughest, most brutal legions. And Galba was a man to get things done. This often put him at odds with those beneath him, particularly his soldiers. And he had a reputation for being a strict disciplinarian and not one to be messed with. Mm. He also traveled with Claudius to Britannia. And apparently Claudius was quite fond of Galba by all accounts. And I I couldn't quite tell if Galba was actually fighting over in Britannia or if he just went with Claudius. Because Claudius kind of went on like a trip. Mm-hmm. To visit mm-hmm. while the war was going on, oh, okay. The conquest, so not like a not like a let's join the fighting, but like right. let's let's little, go see what visit happened. the troops and yeah, yeah. okay, you know, give give a little rousing speech. Yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. After many years of service as a military and political leader, he was granted governance of one of the Hispania provinces by Nero. And remember, this is the guy Agrippina had tried to seduce into marriage, right? right yeah, because she could smell success. Yeah. I mean, and, it sounds uh, like a nice retirement. Yeah, well, he was he was living it up. Thus, Galba found himself wealthy and secure in the <laughs> far west of the empire. Right. And then Vindex kicked up trouble. Do you remember Vindex from last week? It's a familiar name. Yep. Yeah. That's the guy, the governor from Gaul, 
who rose up against Nero. Ah, right. It was yes. like, I'm tired of That's spending right. all of our money mm-hmm. so that you and your friends can have parties and go to Greece. Well, yeah. These taxes are ridiculous. And why are you... You are a <laughs> terrible emperor, sir. He makes a good point. He, he certainly <laughs> did. Uh, so he rose up in revolt, but he didn't declare himself emperor. He instead was like, yo, Galba. Okay. What do you think? And Galba didn't immediately respond because he's a, he's a smart guy. You know, this could, this could go one of two ways. He's also very ancient. Yeah, he's a very old man. Uh, he played it safe and waited for more governors to declare for him before publicly announcing his intentions to take control. Smart. Doesn't seem power hungry then. Yeah, he definitely was though. Well, uh, but one smart. of these governors <laughs> is a man we talked about last week. Do you remember Otho? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he was one of Nero's close friends right. during his early reign. They enjoyed partying really hard. Did and he also enjoy beating people up? And beating up strangers okay, in okay. pubs together right, was the next go. sentence. So, <laughs> yes, good right, job. Memories back. Yes. So, it's unclear if Otho was the bad influence on Nero or vice versa. Yeah, probably the list, little of that. Mutual. Little, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're bad people. Right, yeah. Uh, either way, there were two peas in a pod. Okay. According to Dio, Cassius Dio, Otho hosted a feast for Nero and Agrippina on the night of the sinking ship. Okay. <laughs> kind of the last bit of deception to put right. her at ease. Yeah. And have a big feast with your friend and yeah, yeah, good yeah. time. Uh, I didn't mention it last week because there was a lot to talk about, but obviously Nero's extravagant lifestyle trickled down to the people in his upper government and inner circle. That makes uh, sense. That is to say, everyone was super corrupt. Yeah. Including <laughs> Otho. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Praetorian prefect to succeed oh. Burrus. Remember, mm-hmm. Burrus was the man who was kind of holding it together and then he died. Yeah. And then it just all kind of fell yeah. apart. Uh, the man to replace him was called Ophonius Tigellinus. Yeah. Tigellinus. And I might, uh, t- Tigellinus. And I'll probably mispronounce that a couple times. <laughs> but he was known to be the cruelest and most corrupt of Nero's higher officials. So Praetorian prefect. Yeah. Real mean guy. Remember his name. Tigellinus. Oh, I can't forget Tigellinus. I can't, can't forget that. <laughs> Anyway, you will remember Papea Sabina from last week. Mm-hmm. She was the woman who Nero really wanted to marry but couldn't. Right. Oh, yeah. Is this the one that his mom was like, nah? Yes. And who kind of looked like his gotcha. mom. Oh, right. And right. so she was like, you know, maybe you should kill her. <laughs> yeah. We, we need to do something about her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, before killing Agrippina, Nero had enlisted Otho to help him with this issue of not being able to see her. Mm -hmm. The arrangement was that Otho would marry Sabina. That's right. But keep his hands off her so Nero could have her as a mistress of sorts. Okay. However, Otho soon fell in love with his wife and didn't feel like sharing. Well, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised either. (laughs) The two friends fell out, and Nero, there was actually a point where Nero like sent for her, and Otho said no, oh. and then Nero showed up at her house, <laughs> at their house, and was like, okay. let me in, and he said no. no. Okay. So he got banished. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't get murdered. Well, I think it's because they were friends. Yeah. So this banishment was uh, to a governorship. Okay. So not like go away. It's like go away, but be useful right. to me. More more to add to the fact that Nero was just kind of a spoiled brat and not just a psychopathic killer. Right. Correct. Correct. And uh, he was he's, he got sent off to the governorship of Lusitania, which would be around modern Portugal. Okay. So over by where mm-hmm. Spain is as well. Um, while there, it is said that Otho ruled quite well. Did a really good job by all accounts. He seems to have grown out of his wild partying days. And did some proper governing. Seemed like he wanted to be in charge and wanted to do well. This meant that Otho and Galba were both on the Iberian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So that's where Spain and Portugal are. So the moment Galba announced his acceptance of the purple, Otho immediately declared for him. It's like, (laughs) I'm on board. (laughs) Let's go. Uh, He joined up with the old man just before Galba set out for Rome. And along the way, Otho was not idle at all. Otho worked diligently to make nice with the legion marching with them. He interacted with the soldiers daily. Smart man. He learned their names and spoke with them regularly. Some he even offered financial support and gifts. I might be catching a whiff of another emperor. Oh, maybe. Another one of the four. (laughs) Could this possibly be? Already, Otho was plotting to be named heir. 
Yeah. <laughs> Galba was 70, after <laughs> yeah, all, and yeah, Otho yeah, yeah. wasn't even 40 yet. Remember, Nero died at 30. Well, and yeah, they were besties, Nero so was a spoiled child. He so. certainly was. And Otho Until was around 36. Death. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it part of this makes me wonder if Otho had just been getting cushy with Nero and doing the drinking and the partying and all of that to stay close to Nero. I'm sure it was part of it. To get yeah. power. Yeah, that would make sense. To, to elevate himself. Because he, he comes from an equestrian family. Oh, okay. Which is below the patricians. He's not yeah. senatorial. Yeah. Certainly has no business being in charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the soldiers already weren't too pleased with Galba. As I, as I said, Galba had a reputation for strict discipline. Yeah, just yelling at him. Perfect. Yeah, and too strict for yeah. these common soldiers. Now, here's a quote from Tacitus. His strictness, which had once been esteemed and had won the soldiers' praise, now vexed them, for they rebelled against the old discipline. Through 14 years, they had been trained by Nero to love the faults of the emperor. <laughs> so they just loved to do what they wanted and not get appeased for it. Right, yeah. Not the right word. Appeased. Not the right word. <laughs> Punished. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, disciplined, <laughs> yes. Well, and it, it, I love Tacitus. His ly- his uh, lyrics, his <laughs> prose is very nice. <laughs> and the way he says, like, yeah, Nero sucked yeah. for 14 years and, and it made was the soldiers great bad. for us. Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> Galba took several months to march from Spain to Italy. That's a really long time. Yeah. I'm just like trying to think of the geography and I'm like, it's not it's really go several months. Just a little bit of modern yeah. France and then you're into yeah, Italy. Yeah. I was like, they, they seem real close. So. Yeah. <laughs> In that time, one of the Praetorian prefects did some of his own scheming. <gasps> so the Praetorian prefects uh, were two men, Tigellinus, who we mm-hmm. discussed, and Nymphidius Sabinus. Were they both with Galba at this point? Like in no, his march? Was they're in Rome. Tigel- oh, they both are. They're both oh, in Rome. okay, gotcha. So scheming in Rome, gotcha. Okay. Yes, correct. So um, Tigellinus is kind of on the chopping block mm-hmm. since Nero was gonna was dead. Right. Because uh, everyone hated him. Yeah. He was a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, Nymphidius, not so much. He was just the other Praetorian prefect. Mm-hmm. Now, it's important to note that a big reason that Nero gave up and you know killed himself was because the prefects sided with Galba. Ah, yeah. Because he was like, I don't even have the the praetorian guard anymore yeah i don't have anything so screw mm-hmm. it it's over now tigelinus was getting pretty scared because once galba arrived there was a really good chance that this strict disciplinarian was going to kill him so nymphidius was like all right well how about this how about this you make me the only praetorian prefect and you leave oh so just make me the only one and you then yeah. then you can live a power play yeah yeah and then he left Oh, well, got it to worked. Leave. Got, yeah, got to run <laughs> off. Nymphidius had high ambitions. Uh, while Galba was making his slow way to Rome, Nymphidius decided to take the throne for himself. <laughs> yeah, this guy's taking too long. Mine. <laughs> yeah, guys, it's do we right really there. Want this old man who can't I can even do it. get over here from Spain. Like, come on now. <laughs> uh, he declared that he was the illegitimate son of Caligula. Okay, how do you prove that wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one of those like, ah, you know, people say that they're the, the descendants of Jupiter. So, you know, what are we yeah. going to do here? Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> to make it more official, he married Nero's wife. Okay. Now, do you remember mm-hmm. who Nero's wife was? No. Okay. So, he had the two wives. Wait, is this his cousin wife? Nope. Remember, okay. he executed her. <laughs> All right. Claudia. And then he maybe kicked to death. Maybe, right. Papea. Why she was pregnant? Yes. That's right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, there's another wife in oh, quotes oh, oh, that's that he right. had. Was this, this the unofficial one? This was the teenage the, the boy. The teenage boy, yeah. Nero yeah. had castrated and yeah. then married as his wife. Right. This is Sporus. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> okay, so. Okay. All right. Nymphidius is like, okay, I'm going to be the son of Caligula. Yeah. And I'm going to marry the wife of Nero. Did he know that wasn't official? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I guess. Uh, <laughs> now, the Praetorian guards looked around and went, guys. Didn't we just oust a guy for doing this kind of stuff? <laughs> uh, yes. Maybe we just do that again. <laughs> and very quickly, oh, Nymphidius was executed. Dang. Yeah. That, oh, wait. Diglinus, come back. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> they don't want him back right. either. 
So looking good for Galba, not even to the capital and already putting down rebellions. Yeah. Yeah. So for the record, uh, Nymphidius does not count as one of the four emperors. He didn't take he, power. He, didn't, he just said, I'm going to, yeah. and then died. <laughs> yeah, he didn't He didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, there was a small battle between Galba's army and one sent by Nero before his death. Uh, Galba won this and arrived in Rome in October of 68. That's now, right. he had been declared emperor by the Senate mm-hmm. in early June. So that's months yeah. that it took him to walk. It My was goodness. very slow. This man just like, guys, we... A mile, maybe two a day, you know, really got to take it easy. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was rough going. So God, Galba was a stickler for the rules. Obviously, mm-hmm. you weren't going to bribe or get anything special out of this emperor. Right. That was just not going to happen. But his most loyal advisors and freedmen. Oh, yeah. you better believe they'll accept a bribe. Mm-hmm. In fact, they won't just accept a bribe. They will demand one <laughs> for their services. <laughs> Thus, a wild and free corrupt government under Nero Mm -hmm. was replaced by an ungodly strict and corrupt government under Galba. So much better. So much better. (laughs) And this pissed everyone off. Yeah. See, the Senate and army hated Nero, Mm -hmm. but the common people didn't mind him much because he put on games and it was super fun. Lots of liquor and dead people and music. Right. Good times. What can go wrong? But Galba was not going to put on games. They were a waste of money. And speaking of money, why don't you give me some of that? Oh, okay. That was Galba's way of doing things. Okay. All right. So lots of taxes and no games. Right. He needed to tax heavily, though. Nero and his officials had bled the coffers dry. Didn't, wasn't the... Who was the man who first recommended Galba to be emperor again? Uh, Vindex. Vindex. Wasn't his one of his main complaints that they're being taxed too much? Yeah, but that was you're you're taxing us so much because you're off being corrupt oh, and wasting you're the corrupt, money. Oh, because corrupt. Now we need to right. tax you a lot because we need to fix the country right. or the emperor. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay. So, uh, how does Galba raise the money? That's the question. He's it. They're broke. I I don't know. Door to door collection. Let's <laughs> well, go. <laughs> kind of. So new taxes. Yeah. All right. And then a bunch of the stuff and money and mm. properties that mm-hmm. Nero and his cronies had given away just as gifts all the time. Yeah. You got to give 90% of that back right now. Wow. Hey, so he gave you a horse. Yeah. I'm going to need 90% of that. <laughs> no, you can keep the head. <laughs> <laughs> I want the, I want the back end. Yeah, wow. Don't ask why. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, if they're like, uh, well he, I spent it. Yeah. I, I bought like he stuff. gave it and he's me. like, all right, well, I guess we're going to go to the merchants that you bought stuff from. We're going to get the 90% back. You can see how this wasn't going to work. What a terrible idea. And it was super unfair. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, this was given to me by the government. You can't just come and demand it back. <laughs> oh, but I can. <laughs> oh, but I can. And uh, the final way that he was going to save money on top of new taxes, mm-hmm. getting this money back, no more games. Um, you know how tradition says that you pay the army and the Praetorians a bribe? Yeah, to keep them happy. When you become a new emperor? Right. Yeah, he wasn't going to do that. Well, no, he's too strict and oh yeah, you noble, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. He's a stickler. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nymphidius had even promised more than usual, and they wanted that money too. <laughs> Galba just well, said, "No, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's not going to happen." So everyone was getting pretty unhappy about Galba. The people were also pissed that Tigellinus had been allowed to live and go off ah, into retirement. Yeah, like Galba had officially pardoned mm-hmm. him. Essentially, it was just like, "No, it's fine." His crimes needed to be punished, according to the people. One group that was most worrisome at this time was the Rhine Legion. Okay. So, if you'll remember, these are the best legions in the entire empire. The most battle-hardened, elite soldiers. And they're getting upset. Now, they even have memories. Now, Galba had, you know, ruled over them 20, Mm -hmm. 30 years prior. Yeah. So, it's been a while. But, like, there's a collective memory in the legions that, like, Galba was awful. Right, we don't like him. You, yeah. You're in the military. You understand units have their like yeah. collective identity and memory sure of things. Do. So yeah, they knew who Galba was, and they're like, oh god, no, we don't want that. So they were on the risk of rising up. Mm-hmm. They were also the ones that went and put down Vindex's revolt initially. Okay. So remember what happened after Vindex lost? The winning army tried to make their general emperor. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So the Rhine legions had already They're tried already, to play kingmaker. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, that guy had said no. Oh. But it was looking kind of rough. Mm-hmm. 
So Galba's like, we need to send someone up there who just isn't right for the job, essentially. Need to send a man who won't rise up because he's kind of lazy okay. and fat. Okay. Well, all right. Vitellius, he thinks to himself. <laughs> The fat, lazy guy who just likes to eat a lot. Let's send him up there because he has no ambition. Just to just be in charge of them. Yep. I'm sure they're going to be fine with that and just listen to him. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'll. That's, I think it'll be great because they've already shown that they don't disobey anything. Right. And yeah. I definitely mentioned this because it doesn't foreshadow anything. No, not at all. <laughs> right. So with that sorted, Galba got <laughs> to thinking about why everyone was so pissed at him. Why is everyone I have no so idea. mad? I can't imagine. I don't imagine. get it. Couldn't he didn't imagine. have a good grasp on why the people were upset. Do you? Here, I'm, I'll give you a hundred guesses. You tell me why he thinks the people are upset with him. Wow. Oh man. Why he thinks? Why he, he seems, believes? The he people seems are upset. delusional if he doesn't understand why they're mad. A little bit. I don't okay. know because the games aren't going on. That'd be a logical reason. He doesn't seem very logical, though. No. Well, he's very logical and calculating, but this he just doesn't seem to get. He d- <laughs> okay, he does not know how emotions work Correct. at all. Correct. All right. So the reason that he thinks people are mad at him uh-huh. is because he doesn't have an heir. Okay, well, you know, also pretty logical. It makes some level of sense, yeah. but given the climate, it's like yeah, there's probably no, better you reasons. Yeah, there's probably better there's plenty of things going on right. here. So his thinking was Nero didn't have an heir. Right. Which is why everyone hated him. The only reason the why, only actually. Reason, <laughs> yeah. Which has some kind of logic to it, but not much. No. <laughs> so now Otho felt mm-hmm. that he was in prime position. It, surely, after proving himself to Galba, working hard, and getting in the army's good graces, he would be named heir. No. And then Galba came out and announced some guy named Piso was the heir. Some some guy. Some guy. I mean, he was an important guy yeah. in the government and stuff, but yeah. yeah just some guy, essentially. He, awesome. And he also, like, was really indifferent about it. Galba gave this long speech, <laughs> and then Pizzo was like, yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll be, the, I'll be there. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> yeah. So everyone gave a, co- like, the Praetorians and the armies gave a collective meh. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, that doesn't really help anything. But Otho was pissed. I bet. And in fact, almost everyone was very unimpressed. Yeah. The situation was not getting better. Sounded very anticlimactic. <laughs> Most notable, the Rhine legions were still very unhappy. What? Yeah. But he sent an unambitious person to go lead them. Yeah, and he named an heir. <laughs> yeah. Why? I don't understand the why The problems have been solved. <laughs> it's been resolved, guys. So January 1st, traditionally, uh-huh. all the legions of the empire renew their vows of allegiance to the to emperor. To the emperor. Okay. So January 1st, 69 CE... Nice. The Rhine Legion, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the Rhine Legions refused to yeah. swear their loyalty to Galba. Didn't see that coming. Yeah, this is troubling. Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> now Otho saw the writing on the wall, and mm-hmm. here's a quote from Suetonius: "Now he had hoped to be adopted by Galba and looked forward to it from day to day, but when Piso was preferred and he at last lost that hope, he resorted to force, spurred on not merely by feelings of resentment, but also by the greatness of his debts." Hmm. paying all those people all that money to make them like him was sure costly yeah <laughs> uh with no further prospects of becoming emperor through peaceful means otho <laughs> set about inciting a coup <laughs> yeah so he paid and schemed with around 40 of the praetorian guards and other high-ranking officials oh my yep on january 15th 69 nice mm-hmm. galba was observing a sacrifice Otho asked to be excused to go oversee the purchase of some property in the city. Right. After leaving the palace, those guards that he'd been working with hoisted him up on a chair and proclaimed him emperor. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yep. All right. The rest of the guards then mostly fell in line because they're like, okay, he's mm-hmm. probably going to pay us. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like Galba. Uh, and what they really wanted was to get paid. Yeah. Uh, word was trickling into Galba by this point. And soon it was clear that Otho had been declared emperor. And he's like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Galba sent Piso to go speak with some of the soldiers and kind of be like, come on, guys. Like, come on. Why would that work? Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. I'm honestly surprised they didn't kill Piso. Yeah. Um, there was a great scramble as the various armed groups quickly chose sides, mm-hmm. most declaring for Otho. Yeah. One group of Marines had been brutally treated by Galba. Now, the Navy was not respected in Roman times. Okay. You are infantry or 
a little bitch boy on a boat. Right, right. Um, and one story that I didn't actually put in here is when these Marines came to meet Galba on his march to Rome and mm-hmm. be like, hey, we, we were actually made infantrymen by Nero. He's like, eh, screw you guys, and decimated them. Had them kill one tenth of their army. <laughs> what? Yeah, what? there's more to that what? story than what, <laughs> what? I just what? said. What? Either but, way, what? Why? What? It was wild. Just it was wild. So these guys immediately joined the Praetorians. Were like, yeah, yeah, fuck Galba, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So Galba and his advisors barred them, themselves up in the palace mm-hmm. to try and figure out what they're going to do. While deciding what to do, an envoy arrived, and he declared Otho had been killed. Huzzah! Wow. I, Thus, the second emperor of the year 69 CE was dead. Actually, no. That sounded like a trick. People began <laughs> filing into the palace <laughs> okay. to declare their allegiance to Galba. Okay. They had been swindled, obviously. Like, he, he should take them all back, for they were oh, brave and loyal. Was that, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. You can't say I'm loyal after you just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But then more rumors were coming in. Some claimed Otho was still in the Praetorian camp. No. Others said that they'd seen him killed in the streets. Okay. One soldier even came forth with a bloody sword proclaiming that he had killed Otho personally and taken his head. Where is it? What do you think Alba thought of that? No. 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 I don't like that. I'm a strict man. <laughs> Who gave you that order? Yeah. Was what he said. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, Galba. <laughs> so now everything was confused. They're yeah. like, what what is going on? And Galba decided there was only one way to figure out if Otho was still alive, and he donned his breastplate and headed out to the forum. Terrible idea. Yep. The city was gathering and watching. Fear and confusion reigned. Yeah. As Galba approached the forum, he could see Otho oh. alive and well. Well, you should probably stop at this point. He was standing on a platform where, not long ago, Galba's own statue had stood. Oh. Yeah. You really should turn around. (laughs) Then suddenly, cavalrymen burst through the crowds. They trampled over commoners as they charged at Galba. Who cares about them? The old man was thrown from his chair as the men carrying him dropped it and ran. (laughs) He was just being carried. Yeah. (laughs) Soon, those few still loyal to Galba were overrun. Tacitus says he might have said something to the effect of strike quickly if such actions are for the state's interest, mm. which is kind of badass. Yeah, sure. Uh, just kind of a pissed off old soldier right up to the end. Yeah. <laughs> and so the guardsmen cut him down and then they just kept cutting. Oh, okay. well, you know, <laughs> soon the corpse was nothing but a bloody breastplate with no arms, legs or head. <laughs> and now we truly have one emperor down in the oh, year yeah. of the four emperors, which just so lovingly is the year 69. Yeah, it's yeah, perfect. It's just great. Uh, Galba. What, is, this, is this in January? Yes. January 15th. Good. Yes. So so Galba ruled from June of 68 yeah. up to January of 69. Okay. Galba did a lot of things wrong, despite many believing he would have been a great fit for the job. Remember, everyone declared for him off the bat. Well, maybe he would have been if he would have eased into things a little bit or explained something, you know, yeah. not just smacking the people around. For sure. Yeah. Uh, another fun quote from Tacitus. He seemed too great to be a subject so long as he was subject. And all would have agreed that he was equal to the imperial office if he had never held it. (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) So, you know, everyone thought, but everyone was wrong. wrong. So now Otho was in charge Mm -hmm. and he set about righting the wrongs of Galba. He paid the Praetorians their usual bribe and a little extra on the side. He accepted the crowds calling him Nero. Oh, because the commoners loved Nero mm-hmm. and at least loved him a lot more than grumpy old Galba. Right. He, he quickly changed that because Nero sucked. Right. But yeah. at first he was like, okay, you can call me Nero. That's sure. fine. Yeah. We'll take Finally, it. he called for Tigellinus, Tigellinus, Tigellinus to return to Rome. Baby, come back. <laughs> Get over here, boy. <laughs> uh, so Galba again had let him go off into retirement despite his crimes. Mm-hmm. And the people in the Senate hated him for his cruelty and corruption. So Tigellinus knew that returning meant death. Right. So he did what he was best at. He bribed the messenger <laughs> to give him one more night, and then he threw a huge party. Oh, okay. And he just partied like it's 1999. 
despite <laughs> having no context for what that would mean. <laughs> you know, in a Y2K <laughs> reference right now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Right, you know. okay. And what else are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he partied very hard. And then the next morning before heading off to Rome, he yeah. said, I need to go shave. And, and ran away. He, no, he slit his own throat. Okay. Which, you know. Well, you know what? Respectable, we I guess. We wanted him dead. Uh, torture sure. would have been better, it I suppose. Worked out. But all that sorted, things were starting to look pretty good for Otho. Mm-hmm. Uh, many were nervous uh, that they would have another Nero on their hands because they remembered his youth. Yeah. But Otho seemed to take the job very seriously and worked hard to run the empire. Okay. And then a messenger arrived. He said, I've come bearing a message for Emperor Galba. Mm-hmm. Otho replied, he is dead. You are addressing Emperor Otho. Mm-hmm. The messenger was a bit ruffled and a bit like off okay. off kilter. He's like, "All uh, right, um, I'm just gonna read this then, <laughs> not for you." To uh. the Emperor Galba, <laughs> the legions of the Rhine do not recognize uh, you as emperor, well. but in your place have proclaimed Emperor Vitellius. Okay, they now march on Rome to put the rightful ruler on the throne. Well, huh? That's a sticky situation. Yeah, Otho <laughs> sat for a second, went. That's not good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, Vitellius was the fat, lazy man Galba had yeah. put in charge. Yeah. To hopefully avoid them getting too oh. rowdy. Well, it seems like that backfired. Yeah. Well, so it wasn't really Vitellius that rose up. As you implied, yeah. they didn't want to listen. No. Yeah. So <laughs> there's two men, two generals of these legions, Caecina and Valens, who actually kind of forced the issue. See, Caecina was in hot water for mm-hmm. embezzlement, which was not okay with Galba. So he saw that his troops were pretty upset and went, Vitelli seems all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and no one's really sure why Valens wanted to revolt. It's not really recorded, but he went along with it. Uh, Vitellius was, uh, again, a fat, jovial man. Got mm-hmm. along quite well with people. Right. Liked a good feast or five. Um, well. That's not an exaggeration. And uh, was similar to Otho in that he was going around being friendly with the troops. Yeah, like okay. That's what he wanted to do. So, perfect. Yeah. Now, these two armies are marching south from Germany mm-hmm. to Rome. One led by Caecina, one by Valens. They split up. And Vitellius is just staying up in Germany. Oh, he's just going to stay there. Yeah. He, he's the declared emperor, emperor but he's he, just going to stay there. Why should he go fight? That doesn't make any sense. Well, um, I figured he'd want to like go to the capital of the empire he's going to be in charge of yeah but there's there's armies in the way and let them clean up and you know yeah make it's a fair path, enough. and then, then we'll get there so now the best legions in the empire were marching on rome yeah and when they heard that galba had been overthrown and otho was in charge they were like still overthrow still overthrow They're like ah we're getting this far yeah <laughs> why, why stop we got a good thing going here so otho tried otho tried to talk the rebel emperor down but to no avail mm-hmm. At this point, he's like, nah, dude, I'm going to be emperor. Like, yeah. <laughs> what like, do you they talked me into it, yeah. you know? <laughs> so Otho marched north uh, to the north of Italy in the hopes of stopping the Rhine legions at the River Po, which is the river that almost cuts the uh, Italian peninsula off. Mm-hmm. His troops were not as skilled nor as experienced as his enemies, but reinforcements were coming. There were quite a few people who had declared for Otho by this point. However, the Vitellians forced the issue by beginning to build a bridge across the Po. So kind of, it was like, ah, well, we got yeah. reinforcements <laughs> coming, but we kind of got to go. Mm-hmm. The battle was fierce. It is estimated that the battalion forces numbered around 70,000. Jeez. Yeah. But their army was split between Caecina and Valens. Mm-hmm. So before Valens could arrive, uh, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus defeated Caecina and sent him running for cover. Ah. This is the same guy who put down Boudicca's uprising mm-hmm. in Britain last week. Okay. Yep. So Valens' troops then arrived, and Otho's men did well, but were eventually overrun. This became known as the First Battle of Bedraicum, and an estimated 40,000 soldiers died in the fighting. Man, gotta love how productive civil war is. It's so good for everything. Oh. <laughs> it's so helpful. Uh, many urged Otho not to capitulate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reinforcements were still coming, obviously, and you know, there's a whole empire of troops around. We just yeah. This is all happening gotta very quickly. Yeah. So they were like, don't give up. Like, we can fall back, we can regroup, we'll mm-hmm. be fine. But Otho was more noble than any had given him credit for being. He said it is far more just to perish one for all than many for one. The next morning, he stabbed himself in the heart to prevent further death in this civil war. Wow. 
Yeah. He just killed himself. He didn't, he didn't try to talk to him. He was like, all right, no, I get it. I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want it's all these people to die. It's not good for the Empire. Right. He just said, well, let's make it easy. Yep. <laughs> it was It was very much I mean, for still, the good of yeah, the Empire. Yeah. Let's, Great sentiment. Yeah. So that's two down. Yeah. And two to go. Well, Vitellius, number three. We know where number three is going. Hearing of Otho's death, it's like, all right, cool. I can... I can mm-hmm. head down to Rome now. Uh, the fat man feasted his way south, stopping as often as he could to get in his three to four feasts a day. This man. <laughs> yeah. He was just like, he wanted to just hang out and eat and party and just chill. He can't blame him. You know, yeah. it sounds like a good life. When he came to the battlefield where his men had defeated Othos, they had left the bodies. Oh. There were so many. Yeah. That it was just, you know, corpses. And he seemed kind of joyful about it, which was in poor taste to say the least. Yeah. Uh, not great. Some stories say that he even like danced on Otho's small grave and or like commented negatively on it. Yeah, I didn't think too much of that. Cause probably not true. That'd be really. You have to be real something to be like outspoken about. Right. <laughs> well, the one thing you need to know, and I think I mentioned this later in my script, but uh, Vitellius and Caligula were mm-hmm. buddies. Okay. So well, that adds up then. Yep. And <laughs> and Vitellius may have been on Capri the island where Tiberius yeah. had all the sex parties yeah. uh, as like a youth. Oh, so, okay. So, well, that's not great. Not great. No. Not a great thing. But uh, Vitellius entered Rome and set about ruling his empire. Mm-hmm. First order of business, obviously, kill all the people who annoyed me before I became emperor. Oh, my God. Now, this wasn't full on like treason trials or political maneuvering. It was very much more just personal. Yeah. Like you. <laughs> Sounds like it. You made fun of me. Get over here. God. Give me your head. Oh my god. Um Oh yeah, and right there is where I mentioned that he was friends with Caligula. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean it adds up. After that was taken care of, he thought he'd look into the Empire itself. How are things going? <laughs> <laughs> first things first i'm gonna kill everyone i just want to kill the important stuff and then i'll look at the empire yes okay so galba had been killed and overthrown mm-hmm. then otho and vitellius got thousands of roman troops killed fighting for right. the throne meanwhile the great jewish revolt was still going on in judea in the east okay i mentioned this very briefly at the yeah. end of nero because right before nero died uh in 66 he sent a general called vespasian to go deal with this massive Jewish uprising. Mm -hmm. And so that's still going on a couple years later. So Vitellius asked his advisors, well, how is that going? Because that's tying up like four of our legions right now. Seems like an important question. It is an important question. An advisor told him, it is going well, my emperor. Vespasian and his son Titus are highly capable generals, and they're making great advances in putting down the rebellion. Soon Jerusalem shall fall excellent as I thought that's wonderful yeah. um they're doing so well in fact that the legions under vespasian have declared him emperor <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh and remember the reinforcements otho had been expecting my emperor uh well they have declared for vespasian and are about to invade italy oh good like like now yeah they're coming in yeah uh, they're on their way already so they were and then they stopped for a second to say oh otho's dead vespasian well, vespasian <laughs> At this point, Vitellius uh, set back and uh, let out a long sigh. Yeah. Then headed off to host another feast. Well, who's got to think on an empty stomach, you know? While he's off putting down his daily 5,000 calories, let's take a look at this new emperor, Vespasian. And spoiler alert, he's the guy that wins. Okay. (laughs) So we'll look at his early life. So Vespasian was born on November 17th, 9 AD. Also uh, in the reign of Augustus, the very end of it. He was born to a very uh, low-ranking family, the Mm -hmm. Flavians. His brother, Sabinus, was super successful. Their mother even mocked Vespasian for not having the same drive as his older brother and saying essentially that you'll be his, like, coat holder. Right, yeah. So that was living in his shadow pretty much forever. It kicked him in his ass a little and he got going. Yeah. He and his brother were actually the first of their family to enter the Senate. Oh, okay. So they're doing very well. Uh, he went through the usual jobs uh, along the way up the Cursus Honorum. He was a military tribune in Thrace under Tiberius, I think. Then he was Quaestor and finally Aedile all in two years. Oh, okay. As a praetor, he won over Caligula. This was after Caligula's German campaign. <laughs> Vespasian had suggested Caligula throw a huge celebration to win over yeah. popular support. There's a point, uh, some some sources mentioned that he showed some sycophant 
uh, stuff at this point. Oh, okay. Uh, tendencies, there we go. Yeah. Where he just kind of will, you know, kiss anyone's ass mm-hmm. to get where he needs to To get to what be. he needs. But, you know, fair. Suetonius tells us at one point Caligula smeared mud on Vespasian's tunic for doing a poor job. <laughs> which Vespasian laughed off yeah. as you would. Yes. But we'll also yeah. see that Vespasian is a very jovial guy. It was right around the reign of Caligula that he also started making babies with his wife, Domitilla the Elder. Okay. Uh, he had one daughter and two sons, Domitilla the Younger, Titus, and Domitian. When Claudius came to power, the two got on great. Mm-hmm. Vespasian was a kind and jovial man who got along with just about everybody. And he got the job done every time. You put him in charge of something, he did it. It's and he a good did record to have. Well. It, yes. Claudius put him in charge of the Rhine legions in 41 CE. Oh, okay. So about 20 years before mm-hmm. this is happening. Um, and then Vespasian went over and helped conquer Britain. So he's got plenty of experience. Yes. Uh, we'll discuss it more in Mastery of Military Might, but let's say he did very well mm-hmm. in Britain. Um, So well that he was granted a consulship a few years later in 51 CE. Once Nero came to the throne, Vespasian went into retirement, mainly to keep Agrippina the Younger from killing him. Oh, well. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So Vespasian had been close with one of Claudius's freedmen. Mm -hmm. Remember, Claudius was basically run by his freedmen and his wives. Um, Narcissus. Agrippina hated Narcissus. So it was a pretty good idea on Vespasian's part to get out of Dodge. After Nero was firmly in charge, uh, Vespasian was granted the governorship of Africa, which is modern Tunisia and Algeria. Okay. So just like the northern, Mm -hmm. northwestern part. Suetonius, quote, he ruled it soundly and with considerable dignity, except when he was pelted with turnips during a riot at Hedrometum. Turnips? Turnips. In a riot, yeah. Hey, ow. Suetonius gives no more context to That's this. That's it. <laughs> and I couldn't find like what had happened. But yeah, he was he was known to be a bit uh, greedy mm-hmm. with money. Okay. So, you know, pissing people off. But he was also broke at this time. And so got uh, loans from his brother and then joined the mule trade while he was in Africa. And people mocked him, calling him the muleteer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So generally, pro consuls, people who have mm-hmm. been consul and go off to govern, uh, are rich. Yeah, and so they right. go into a province and they use their wealth to just steal all the other wealth from oh, the province. Right, good. And get out. Well, Vespasian was broke, so he actually mm-hmm. had to govern and run oh, a business. Okay. He had and to make to money. Yeah, he had know? to earn money. <laughs> yeah. it's dumb. Uh, I mentioned briefly last week that Nero went on tour for music, mm-hmm. games, and the art. Yeah, this tour was in Greece, and Vespasian went with him. He was okay. actually in the inner circle of Nero by this point. However, he deeply offended the young singing emperor when he fell asleep during one of his performances. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Yeah, so Nero banished him. Mm-hmm. And uh, Vespasian laid low for a couple of years, fearful that Nero might execute him. Good fear. At any moment. Yeah. But then he suddenly found himself appointed governor once again. But not in Africa this time. Instead, he was being handed three or four, I saw conflicting reports, legions, and heading off to Judea. Okay. Nero was looking a little desperate, Mm -hmm. this time a little nervous, and it's 66 CE, and he's like, I just need, you you can do the job. Right. Uh, They're they're revolting out there. I just want to sing. Can you please go? (laughs) I just want (laughs) to (laughs) sing. Vespasian, always the charmer, said, Mm -hmm. don't worry about it. I got it. I got this. So Vespasian set off for the east to put down the uprising. Surely this won't take long, he thought. Uh, Best bring my son Titus along with me. Mm -hmm. And at this point, Vespasian was in his mid-50s and Titus was approaching 30. Okay. Give you some context. Yeah. As they were about to head off for the march, he heard someone say, can can I come? Can I come too, dad? Um, Okay. Vespasian (laughs) turned and found his younger son, Domitian, standing there in full military attire adorable wait yeah. wh- how he, much he's, younger though uh, i think he would, would have been just... late teens or early 20s he would have been okay. an adult yeah yeah but younger yeah vespasian ever the pleaser comforted his son and politely told him no <laughs> <laughs> and then he set off to mission looking very resentful yeah. and irritated as he said goodbye to his brother titus yeah not surprised just kind of twitching slightly right <laughs> not happy <laughs> and they set off we're going to discuss the judean campaign in detail in mastery of military might but let's just say Vespasian and Titus do very well. Mm-hmm. Two years into the conflict in 68 CE, Nero was ousted and committed suicide. Yep. 
Vespasian gladly accepted Galba as emperor. Everyone else was doing so, and he probably knew Galba because yeah. he was in Britain when Vespasian was there, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Galba was well known at this point. Once Galba was dead, however, Vespasian began to see an opportunity. He heard word that Otho had killed Galba and been named emperor. Meanwhile, the Rhine legions had declared Vitellius emperor. Yeah, that's a lot of information to just start getting. And you're like in the middle of a campaign. Yeah. You're like, guys, Far away what are you too. doing? You're yeah. across the <laughs> yeah, empire exactly. fighting. Yeah. The farthest. Like, what is happening over there? Uh, so I haven't done this much because it's, it's all dumb. But uh, Suetonius loves to share um, omens. Mm-hmm and prophecies and yeah. stuff. But I thought today that I would share some of the omens that apparently uh, led Vespasian to going, you know what? I think I think I need to go for <laughs> it's this. It's time. <laughs> uh, so he tells us about a lot of them, but I'll just give a few. So a dog carried a severed hand into wherever Vespasian was having breakfast and dumped it under his table. Okay. Got to be emperor. Yeah. Vespasian, <laughs> Vespasian had dreamed that when Nero lost a tooth, great things would happen. And then Nero lost a tooth the next day. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two eagles had fought over the battlefield at Pedraicum, where Otho mm-hmm. and Vitellius fought, only for a third to swoop in and beat up the victorious eagle. Well, there you go. That I mean, so, that's the closest one. That, yet, that one makes a little sure. more sense. Yeah. There, there were more, but you get the point. Yeah. <laughs> Vespasian was getting a little amped up at this point to fill the power vacuum and seize control. But Vespasian was patient. Mm-hmm. He didn't declare himself emperor right away. He waited for an opportunity. He was not going to outright declare himself either. It was like, right. we need to see where this is going. Well, yeah, he's so far away. But then his hand was forced. So you recall that I said Otho had been waiting for reinforcements and that those reinforcements were marching on Rome now. Yes. Okay. So those guys were hanging around in Moesia, which is to the northeast of Italy. Okay. They were initially marching in to reinforce, but then Mm -hmm. stopped and went, shit, what are we going to do? And they were not fans of Vitellius. Some of the men in these legions had served under Vespasian in the east and they liked him. Mm Mm-hmm. They put his name in the running for, quote, dudes we would rather have as emperor than Vitellius. Right, right. And then, without orders, they declared Vespasian emperor. Dang. And marched for Rome. Oh, I see where the hand was forced. (laughs) And in their mind, the Spanish legions had created Galba. Mm -hmm. The Praetorian guards had created Otho. Mm -hmm. And the Rhine legions had created Vitellius. Yep. Well, it's their turn. Yeah, right. If they did it, we can too. Right. With this move, the commander in Egypt declared for Vespasian and had his legions swear allegiance as well. Mm -hmm. This was on July 1st, 69 CE, so a a couple months into Vitellius being emperor. This is the date commonly accepted as Vespasian's rise to the throne, but contested because he's technically a usurper at this point. Vespasian sent one of his generals, Gaius Licinius Musianus, to the west okay. to support the invasion of Italy. He's like, okay, those guys are acting without my orders. Mm-hmm. But let's send an actual army to go yeah. <laughs> do something for you real. Can relay what I actually want to happen. Right. Perfect. <laughs> so this guy was actually the governor of Syria. And when Vespasian had arrived, they didn't get on well because he was like, I'm in charge of this revolt, you know, putting it down. Yeah. And Vespasian's like, no, dude, I am. Like- <laughs> but then Titus actually, and we'll talk mm-hmm. more about Titus later, he he was like the peacemaker. Okay. And by this point, Musianus was on Vespasian's side and he was going to go off and win him his empire. Uh, Vespasian himself then went to Alexandria to secure Egypt and likely to cut off the grain supply to Italy. Ooh, it's a good way to kind of do a little siege there if you yep, need to. Because they will starve. Yeah. Yep. So it's like, all right, well, you lose. Yeah. I have Egypt, so <laughs> good luck. Um, by this time, the legions of Dalmatia and Illyricum had also declared for Vespasian. So okay. lots of troops yeah. are declaring for him. Seeing that the game was up, Vitellius tried to abdicate. Yeah, he said, that's fine. You can have it. He's like, I just, you know, I give up. Yeah. <laughs> you, just fine. I want to go feast. Yeah, that's, cool. that's cool. Can I just chill? Can I just chill? I'm going to retire, eat, you know? And the answer was yes. Yeah. It's like, that's fine. Okay. So Vespasian's brother, Sabinus, the one who's super successful, mm-hmm. has been in Rome this whole time, as well as Domitian, because mm-hmm. he left him behind. Right. Um, Sabinus 
had been urban prefect of the city until Galba ascended. Now, urban prefect is commander of the city guard. Okay. Not the Praetorians. Mm-hmm. Still a very important role. Um, Galba had removed him, but once Galba was overthrown, Otho put him back in that position. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> kind of l- government changing quickly. does lots of <laughs> things. Throughout 69 CE, Sabinus was sending updates to Vespasian. He was kind of his, oh, okay. his eyes and ears in yeah. the city. When Vitellius came out on top, Sabinus and his son, who was actually consul at the mm-hmm. time, so it was a pretty successful family, had the urban legions declare for Vitellius to avoid further bloodshed. Now that the legions of Vespasian were on the march, it was left to Sabinus to accept Vitellius' surrender and essentially rule until Vespasian arrived. Yeah. So the deal was made and agreed upon, and Vitellius went out to meet the approaching army to surrender. But then the Praetorians... And the German legions were like, oh, no, you I, well, that's don't. that's right, because they made him. <laughs> Get back. Well, they made him, and he made them. Right. Because now yeah. a lot of people are in positions that once he's gone, they're mm-hmm. not going to be in those positions right. anymore. Yeah. So they're like, no, 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 you sniveling coward. <laughs> we're in this to the end. You're and fight. <laughs> this was so, like, not a foregone conclusion, but it wasn't looking good. Yeah. There's a reason he wanted to abdicate. Yeah, right. So they went back, and... <laughs> The troops then besiege Sabinus and his family in the capital. Like, you know, they have their own little palace yep, area yep. that they're hiding out in. Not a great look. A lot of stuff got burned. Yeah. Uh, most of Sabinus' family escaped along with the mission. Okay. We'll, we'll talk more about that next Maybe week. Maybe good. <laughs> but Sabinus was captured. <gasps> Vitellius attempted to calm his troops down and spare Sabinus. Oh, no. But he was not in control anymore. Oh, they brutally murdered Sabinus and dumped him in the place where the scum of society were left to rot. That's not going to end well no. for everyone involved in that. Yeah. Fortunately for them, Vespasian is a very forgiving person. But we'll see. It's a uh, lot to forgive. <laughs> Vitellius, probably panicking as he finished his fir- third feast for the day, right. sent Caecina, one of the generals that came down from Germany mm-hmm. with him, out with the troops to stop the revolting legions from entering Italy. Now, a note on Caecina. He had been put in his position in the Rhine legions by Galba. Okay. Galba then found out Caecina was embezzling money right. and found him guilty. Right. This caused Caecina to push for Vitellius to be emperor, so already a turncoat. Mm-hmm. Now, with half the might of the Roman emperor bearing down on him, he tried to convince his men to turn cloak too. Oh. <laughs> but they his, threw him in chains. Yeah, I was going to say, his men probably didn't like that. No, yeah. they didn't like that at all. And they already knew him to be a traitor. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like, God, you are just the traitorest of traitors, yeah, aren't right? you, brother? You have no shame when you do anything to save your own tail. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Caecina through and through. So these two massive Roman armies met near Bedraicum. For what would become the second Battle of Bedragum. Well, there you go. Yep. The fighting was fierce and close, and it dragged on into the night. Ooh. Night battles are exceedingly rare in history. Uh, even in modern times, fighting mm-hmm. at night is really hard because you can't yeah. see. Yeah, usually no major conflict happens. Just right. kind of, yeah, small hit and run skirmish, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So this is, you know, well, the entire evening skirmishes happening and then rest and then yeah. fight and rest so Terrible. probably a lot of friendly fire <laughs> probably because yeah. it's hard enough to tell who's who in these times and, and now you're all roman soldiers yeah. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> like, your uniforms are probably very similar <laughs> there's one the one story that uh uh, a couple of guys went in and got some standards from the enemy army. Like they snuck oh, around. Blend in. So then they, everyone was confused then. <laughs> yeah, but they were very yeah, confused too. <laughs> no one knew what was going on. When the sun came up, it was the Flavians who had come out on top. That's Vesp- mm-hmm. Vespasian's family name. And that's how it's often referred to in the, in the sources. Uh, then, just for good measure, they sacked and the, burned the city of Cremona, which was nearby, before heading on to Rome. Caecina was rushed away to see Vespasian once they like found him in his chains because oh, okay. he's still yeah. alive somehow. Oh, right, right. Um, the generals knew that he was going to be murdered quick uh-huh. if he didn't get sent off. So they, they sent him off to Vespasian to see what he wanted to do with him. So the army marched into Rome and heavy fighting ensued in the streets. Now, I don't know how accurate this is, but according to Cassius Dio, 50,000 people died during the taking of Rome. That's a lot. It's a lot of people. Uh, seems a bit inflated, mm-hmm. but still a lot of people. Massive parts of it were also burned down. Yeah. And this isn't too long after the Great Fire. Exactly. So, not great. Not great. 
When the troops finally took control, they found the old fat emperor hiding in a small building. He was dragged to the Jamonian stairs. Do you remember the Jamonian stairs? No. They're the stales of more st- stales. The <laughs> stairs of mourning or the wailing stairs or the stairs of death. Okay, you can throw them down those stairs. Yeah, generally they would strangle people on oh, there okay. and then dump them down as a reminder. Gotcha. And they would just lay there and rot for a few days. Oh, good. Yeah. So once he got here, he called out, "Yet I was once your emperor." Before well, he was strangled and tossed down the stairs. Well, so was every emperor that was murdered. Yes. They were once the emperor. Correct. <laughs> and you're not anymore. Yeah. So goodbye. Thus, the third of the four emperors of 69 CE was dead. Dang. Vespasian was officially declared emperor on December 26th, 69. To recap, Nero committed suicide June 9th, 68. Mm-hmm. Galba made his slow march to Rome and died January 15th, 69. Otho killed the old man and went off to fight the Rhine legions where he lost and committed suicide on April 16th, 69. So Otho about three months. Mm -hmm. Galba six months. Yeah. About. And then Vitellius ruled for a while until hearing that Vespasian was declared emperor in July. And by December 20th, Rome was in shambles and Vitellius was dead. Yeah. So Vespasian was the longest of, or Vitellius was the mm-hmm. longest of the year, but he lost two. And mainly just because it took so long to get from the east. Yeah. Yeah. So now Vespasian is emperor. Vespasian stayed in Egypt for a while to ensure the grain supply was good mm-hmm. since he had been cutting right. it off. Yeah. <laughs> and to ensure that the Judean war was still Under being control. handled. He yeah. had left Titus in charge mm-hmm. of Jerusalem. Well, in charge of taking Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, in his absence, Rome was administered partially by Domitian, his younger son, but mainly by Musianus, the man who came from Syria. Okay. This role would have gone to Sabinus, his brother, but being murdered kind of put an end to that plan. Yeah, it really did. Domitian had been in the city through all of this mm-hmm. and did quite well to keep himself hidden. Suetonius on Vespasian's rise here. Nice quote. The Flavians seized power, and the empire, long troubled and adrift, afflicted by the usurpations and deaths of three emperors, at last achieved stability. And I would argue four emperors, because Nero's death also plunged everything yeah, into chaos. Yeah, so. sure did. So the 60-year-old Vespasian set about fixing all the damage done by the last decade of misrule. There's a lot. There's yeah. a lot to fix right now. Yeah, and the past year of civil war and regime changes. Again, Suetonius. The soldiers, some intoxicated by victory, others resentful and humiliated by Mm -hmm. defeat, had abandoned themselves to every form of license and excess. The provinces, free cities, and various client kingdoms, too, were riven by internal dissent. So the armies were getting out of hand. As it turns out, kingmaking makes a man want to keep making kings. Right. You get a little drunk on power, thinking you can do it all. Never want to go back to reality. Snap back to reality. (laughs) Anyway, he was harsh in his discipline. He forced the resignation of many of Vitellius' men in the army ranks. What do you think he did with his own armies? Mm, Maybe split them up to maintain order throughout the empire? Uh, Yes, but not not in the way... That wasn't the big thing. So one might expect that he would reward them. Yeah. But instead of spoiling his men and giving them huge bonuses, he barely got them their regular pay oh like just barely paid them what they're supposed to be i mean he's probably trying to use more of the money to help the whole empire but yes (laughs) and you'll remember that galba did not bribe the men and it got him killed correct so otho had bribed men and despite his noble suicide it was it went pretty well for him Mm -hmm. and so this can be viewed in two ways either vespasian was dumb right and risking his position Or two, Vespasian knew that teaching these men that putting a new man on the throne gets them lots of money, they're more likely to keep doing it. Yeah, it's a bad precedent. It's like like when you have a dog who barks and you give them a treat or whatever. Right, yeah. It's like, well, now they know to be loud and and they'll get treats. (laughs) Yeah. And let's not forget that these men already were spoiled Mm -hmm. because of Nero. Mm -hmm. So they had become lazy and indulgent under Nero because Nero couldn't be bothered with military discipline. So it kind of makes sense. He's like, I'm going to pay you what you're due, Mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, no, I get it. it. He's also, I feel, a more widely respected by the military emperor in terms of all of his years of service and leadership and his reputation. So I 
think he could maybe get away with it a little better than some random politician emperor right yeah and and that and you you bring up some good points that we'll we'll go into there's actually a really nice quote uh in one of our rounds can't remember which one where i where i mentioned Mm. that so good points um here are just a couple of things we hear about the other forms of discipline he meted out so he had promoted a man Mm -hmm. uh, basically gave him kind of like uh oh what is it called when you when you become an officer your commission yeah so he had given a commission to a man um and when that man came to thank him he smelled of perfume. Oh. Vespasian called him out hard. Yeah. Like, and, excuse me. Can't be going there. And said, I'd rather my soldiers smelt of garlic. And frankly, not bad. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's <laughs> fair. And he took the man's promotion away. Dang. Yeah. So don't, don't do that. When some fire brigade Marines came to request money for new shoes, mm-hmm. he told them that they should carry out their marches without shoes. Oh. Well. So there's a port so rome isn't on the on the sea it has right. a port city nearby called ostia mm-hmm. so these men basically made circuits between the two mm-hmm. places that was part of their duty and because of this future tradition held that th- that unit did not wear shoes huh forever it became oh, part of their just, thing they just did that <laughs> yeah and so it was like one of those like it's harsh huh. but it's not cruel yeah it's it's kind of just like oh you you whining about shoes why don't you just not wear shoes? Yeah, I'd be like, sorry, man, we got the money for that right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I deal suck, with it. <laughs> bro. It's, we got some nice Mediterranean weather. What do you need shoes for? Well, that's a fair point. Like I said, he wasn't cruel, but he needed order. Mm-hmm. And he achieved this by directly attacking specific groups and handing out harsh punishments, but not tyrannical punishments. Like he wasn't executing swaths of men. Right, yeah. In fact, Vespasian was an all-round chill dude when he wasn't commanding soldiers. Uh, Suetonius has chapters on him called his modesty, his tolerance, his lack of resentment, his clemency, his generosity, and more. Very positive. Yes. We'll talk more about some of these during our ranking rounds. But he was also a very clever man. Mm -hmm. Uh, He used propaganda, much as Augustus had done, to legitimize his rule. Remember, up to this point, Almost a hundred years have gone by where the Julio Claudians are the ruling family. Right. Yeah. There, there's no precedent aside from this for anyone else to be in charge. Mm-hmm. Augustus set it up. So the people only knew of the Julio Claudians, and it was Vespasian's job to convince them that he had the right to rule by conquest. Which is the natural order of things, obviously, guys. I mean, we're the Roman Empire. I mean, it kind of is. The really I mean, in history. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, yeah. And for the Romans themselves, we're like, why can we rule Gaul? Mm-hmm. Because we right. conquered. We took it. it. Yeah, we, that's ours. And so I took Rome. Mm-hmm. Now remember, Vespasian is also very newly of the senatorial class. Mm-hmm. He right. was not. Yeah, yeah. You he know, came up pretty. Yeah. So he was kind of low born by their yeah. by their standards. Uh, so Vespasian ruled the empire between the end of 69 and June 23rd, 79 CE. So about a decade. Okay. We will discuss his death more in Departing Demise, but there were apparently constant threats to his life. Uh, the one we know a little about involved Caecina. Okay. Yeah. The turncoat who turned his coat one too God, many times. This guy. This was near the end of Vespasian's reign, I think in 78. This man should have just accepted like life yeah like i get to live stop uh, embezzling i'm gonna just chill <laughs> there's a there's a scene in liar liar where God. jim carrey just screams into the phone stop breaking the law asshole yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah that's what i think of kaisita there's he was killed yeah i hope so eventually there's too many too many people so far we've talked about it's like if you would have just relaxed and you could have had a very comfortable life until you died if you just chilled out just chill bro (laughs) just why you gotta be so into the power thing for real so uh as i alluded to vespasian then died in 79 Mm -hmm. what do you think of him before we get into our rounds you know all around pretty good dude i think yeah yeah yep we we unfortunately don't know a ton of detail about his actual reign like it's just kind of must have been it must have been pretty chill and stable then Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he kind of reminds me of Caesar and Augustus in the way he rose. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, kind of worked hard, mm-hmm. proved Up himself. Through the military ranks and everything. and Which was the Caesar side of it. Yep. And then the Augustus side is once he got there, he like played the role very mm-hmm. well and did what he needed to do. But 
let's jump in to our first round. Mastery of military might. So, Ooh, this would be a good one for this man. Yeah, <laughs> this is the longest section for sure. So he commanded the toughest legions up in the Rhine mm-hmm. for a bit. Um, Claudius put him in charge of many battles in Britain, which he often won. Mm-hmm. We don't actually know the specifics on, you know, this many he won, this many he lost yeah. or anything. But we have a quote from Suetonius, partly under the leadership of Aulus Plautin- Pl- Plautius, I think, and partly that of Claudius himself. He fought 30 times, subjugating two powerful tribes, more than 20 strongholds, mm-hmm. and the offshore island of White, the Isle of White. Mm. It had a different name in here. This earned him triumphal regalia. So you'll remember a triumph Mm -hmm. is the, oh my God, you did such great things in military stuff. We're going to throw this massive religious and political celebration with parades and Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So at this point in time, you couldn't have a triumph unless you were emperor. Okay. But you could have the clothes <laughs> and <laughs> All right. them. well i mean so he got the clothes cool. so essentially he yeah. earned a triumph for how well yeah. he did he also earned a consulship from this mm-hmm. which i mentioned earlier he spent most of nero's reign in semi-retirement only to be called back up to sort out judea mm-hmm. which is kind of like when nero is mad at you and he still is like dude you're you're the guy i need yeah, you to, I I mean, need you to go out deal. there and handle this uh, this shows the respect that Nero had for him. So the great Jewish revolt. Mm-hmm. Let's look at this a little bit more. So the revolt was supposedly sparked when some Greek merchants sacrificed some birds in front of a synagogue. Okay. So, you know, Seems obviously pretty the Jews intentional. Are, yeah, they're <laughs> not, <laughs> not okay with that. This is highly disrespectful. Right. Um, prayers and sacrifices to the emperor were halted at the temple, like the temple yeah. of Jerusalem. High taxes and past wrongs were boiling over, and soon the province was in full revolt. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot more detail than what I'm going into, but that's basically it. Uh, An example of the past wrongs, Crassus, you remember from Caesar's time Mm -hmm. in the first triumvirate, had plundered the temple treasury. Yeah, (laughs) not good. No. And because there are this, you know, almost the sole monotheistic religion, they're constantly being put down. Before Vespasian's arrival, the initial legion sent from Syria into Judea was crushed at the mm. Battle of Beth Haran. I think that's how you say that. The garrison in Jerusalem was besieged and then forced out of the city. So this was big. This yeah. was a, a bad a time loss. for the Romans. Mm-hmm. Um, bolstered by these gains, one of the Jewish armies attempted to take another Roman-held city. No, nope. uh, They were soundly defeated. And because of that, they chose to fight from their many fortified towns and fortresses, mm-hmm. which is what the entire war basically was. was well, yeah, you've, you've got you've got these big protected walls of these cities. Yep, seems like we got an advantage here. <laughs> yeah, this is where we're gonna hold out, guys. They can't they can't kill us all. Yeah. So Vespasian showed up and did a lot of fighting and took many towns. Mm -hmm. A quote from Suetonius. On reaching his province, he impressed even the neighboring provinces with his reform of army discipline and his bravery in a couple of battles, including the storming of a fort at which he was wounded in the knee by a sling stone and took several arrows on his shield. So this is a 60-year-old man Mm -hmm. still leading from the front. Pretty impressive. Very respectable. Um, I've never seen this mentioned. Some people have questioned why Vespasian went to Alexandria after being declared emperor and not didn't go to Rome. Mm-hmm. He sent a different person. I wonder if he wasn't still kind of injured and just wanted the time to recover. Like, yeah, just felt like so that could show up healthy. Was, yeah, yeah, maybe it might have been. So what we're going to talk about primarily as one major example of what he did was the siege of Yadfet, which mm-hmm. I think is how you say that. So in June of 67, Vespasian arrived at the settlement of Yadfet and placed his camp on the northern side. Now, you need to understand, because it took me a little bit to understand what this place was. Imagine you're in kind of the semi-arid environment of Syria slash mm-hmm. Jerusalem, or, uh, Israel area, mm-hmm. and you've got like half a mountain okay, flattened out on the top to a plateau, mm-hmm. fort. Okay. Okay. So that's what he, that is what Yadfet is. Very tall, very uh, hard to get to. Yeah. And then they have walls. Very defensible. Yeah. Very, very defensible. So he and Titus uh, began observing their target and going, what can we do? This is wild. He had the 10th, 5th, and 15th legions along with some local volunteers, and they laid siege. 
The first attempt was an outright charge at the gates. Let's see if we can just take it. Didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so Vespasian ordered the construction of a massive earthen ramp. Okay. So pile dirt and rocks and everything. We're going to make a smaller hill and go over their walls. Wow. But this is, you know, again, like, don't think little hill or a little mm-hmm. mound. This is half a mountain. Yeah. And they're going to try and go over that. <laughs> Just wild. The German enge- or, uh, Roman engineering amazes yeah. me what they were willing to do. So the Jewish forces continued running out and killing those working on the ramp. Obviously. Naturally. That's what you do. Yeah. So uh, Vespasian then ordered 160 catapults and ballistas to fire continuously around the ramp to keep oh, the enemy man. from rushing out and disturbing the construction. So imagine you're digging <laughs> yeah. and digging and digging and you just see a bunch of Jewish bunch people of pro- coming out with swords. Yeah. Projectiles and flying rock. everywhere. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> Just keep Good working, shot, boys. <laughs> Just keep working. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, man. So what do you think the Jewish defenders did at this point as this ramp is being built up to their walls? Built the walls higher. Holy shit. Yeah, that's right. That's what they did. <laughs> that is exactly what they did. <laughs> well, you can't go out. I, it makes sense. Yeah. So as the ramp got closer to their walls, they simply started building the walls up. Yeah. So that's like, oh, yeah, you guys are going to have to build even higher. <laughs> and think about that. The angle that you're building a ramp at yeah. needs to get significantly now bigger. Now you got to backfill it to exactly. get the angle right. To, to yeah. get up. They have to go up five feet. Now you have to add yeah, tons of Yeah, that slope's going to be wild. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a pretty good plan. It was also clear that water was going to be an issue for those that are being besieged. Mm-hmm. Vespasian was like, hmm, how, maybe, maybe we could take out their water reserves with the catapults. Yeah. Again, you can't see the water because they're right. on the ground, and, right. you know, looking up this mountain. But, you know, let's start firing. So they started firing up there. And then eventually they started seeing water seep out of the walls. That's and they're a like, good sign. And they're like, we did it. Yes. Yeah. However, <laughs> this was a cunning ploy by the Jews. Nice. As they were wringing water from their clothes to make it look like the water had been hit. And then Vespasian I, stopped because I thought smart. the water had been, It was. It was very clever. And the ramp continued to grow. Yeah. And once it was high enough, Vespasian sent a battering ram against the wall. What? Yeah. <laughs> they like, they lofted a battering ram up this ramp? Now that's see, I'm not sure. Well, I mean Because the way it was implied the way yeah. it was written was like they finished the ramp and mm-hmm. then sent a ram to the wall. Yeah. But I don't know if that meant just up the normal path. I'm not I sure. I would think it'd be up the ramp. You but but because the so newer part of the wall, probably ahead, the weakest part of the wall. Jumping ahead, once the ramp, once the ram fails, okay, they go back to the ramp. So I'm like, I'm not sure. Yeah, hmm. I'm not sure. Interesting. Anyway, we'll talk about the the ram a little bit. Um, the so they sent up this battering ram, and the defenders rushed out, obviously, and attempted mm-hmm. to burn it, but they were repulsed. Josephus, a Jewish scholar who was present at the time, says one large defender dropped a huge rock on the head of the ram, just cut it Mm -hmm. clean off. Oh, dang. Yeah, this helped, but the ramming (laughs) continued. Um, Then an enemy missile struck Vespasian. This is where he took the the sling. Stone to the knee. Yep. The Romans were pissed. I bet. And continued their bombardment through the night. Just kept slinging rocks. Like, screw you guys. Yeah. So when the sun rose, a breach had been made in the wall. Mm. It was like, oh, this is it. We're going to go in there and we're going to kill them all. But the defenders were like, no, you're not. (laughs) And they poured out. Oh, okay. And kept the kept the Romans yeah. from getting in. Those who attempted to scale the walls during this push mm-hmm. found themselves covered in boiling oil. Good natural defense there. Yeah, not a, not a good time at all. Seeing this was still not enough, Vespasian ordered three siege towers be built, each 15 meters tall. Okay. So very tall. Yeah. These were used not to push up to the wall and take it because obviously that would be impossible mm-hmm. with how steep these this place is. They were used to cover the workers. Oh, okay. So that so they could shield, keep building so the ramp. More ramp. Yeah, okay. more ramp, dude. We're going back to the ramp. This time, they were going to get over those damn walls. Mm-hmm. After 47 days of siege and fighting, oh my God. the ramp was ready. 47 days of piling dirt probably support beams and stuff to make this ramp and your friends dying yeah and fighting the whole time and you know semi-arid conditions just not pleasant miserable the ramp was ready now 
But then a man emerged from the fort. And he informed Vespasian that the situation inside was dire. Mm -hmm. Most of the men had actually deserted in the night. Oh. Because they realized the ramp was ready. Yeah. Those who remained were exhausted and they could not keep men on watch throughout the nights. There was always a point where there Mm -hmm. really wasn't anyone watching. So that night, Titus led a band of men over the walls. They killed the guards and opened the gates. Nice. And the slaughter began. Okay. A quote from Josephus, again, the Jewish Mm -hmm. man who was there. And for the Romans, they so well remembered what they had suffered during the siege that they spared none, nor pitied any, but drove the people down the precipice from the citadel and slew them as they drove them down, at which time the difficulties of the place hindered those that were still able to fight from the defending themselves. It is estimated, again, that 40,000 were slain at Yachtback. Jeez. Yeah, this was big. Below, in one of the caves around the settlement, 40 high-ranking men had been waiting out the siege. Mm -hmm. When all was lost, they decided it would be better to die quickly than at the hands of the Romans. However, you probably are aware of this, suicide was a sin in Judaism. So So they just kill each other? They drew lots and and then were killed by the others in the group. Oh, they drew the short, and then they just kept going around. Actually, murder is not a sin. Right, yeah. Right. It's, it's consensual murder. <laughs> it's consensual. <Yeah. laughs> but when there were just two left, they were like, you Dang. know, maybe we just surrender. <laughs> <laughs> just surrounded by the corpses of their yeah, friends. Like, oh, man. It's like, maybe, maybe we just go meet this guy. So they go out and they meet Vespasian. And one of the Jews then, I'm not really sure why or how, but he prophesied that Vespasian would one day be emperor. Okay. This sounded good to Vespasian. Right. So he spared him and took him in as a personal slave. Okay. Uh, This man would later be freed and granted Roman citizenship under the name Flavius Josephus. Okay. So this is one of the Mm -hmm. primary sources we have for this time. So that's just kind of cool. So the city was not fortunate and not so fortunate as Josephus. The walls were torn down and the settlement was comprehensively destroyed. Wow. They're mad. They were pissed. Vespasian oversaw the rest of the war and put down the revolt, but once the year of the four emperors kicked off, he left the siege of Jerusalem to Titus. Um, After Titus took the city in 70 CE, it was essentially over, but there was one just annoying place that took four more years to take. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) yeah. For his efforts in Judea, uh, Vespasian was granted a triumph. So, essentially, he's had two Two. triumphs, Mm -hmm. Um, and this is wild for the times. Triumphs are super rare. Usually it's a it's an over enthusiastic Claudia or Caligula who's like yeah, I deserve right, triumph. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you see me? Did you, did you see that? I'm great. I <laughs> ran in there and then we came back out. Yeah, we won. We, we won. did it. <laughs> so during his actual reign as emperor, uh, it was mostly peaceful. Mm-hmm. There were a couple. There was some cleanup needed in Britannia that he didn't oversee himself, but it happened. And the kingdom of Comagene sure yeah was annexed in 72 now this is a small kingdom between turkey and syria okay. modern day turkey and syria so that's it that's uh that that's his mastery of military might um uh, i'm impressed yeah he's he's certainly the best we've had since caesar mm-hmm. at least mm-hmm. um i i'm not opposed to giving him a nine or a ten yeah because he he did a lot of fighting, almost entirely successful. Yeah, he did a personal fighting. He led well. Yep, he was he was with his men through and through. Uh, he won a civil war, though mm-hmm. technically he didn't really do the fighting of that. the The one battle that won him yeah. the civil war, he wasn't like leading. But so yeah, I don't know what what do you think? I'm thinking ten. What did I give Caesar? I think ten. I gave Caesar a nine and a half. You did give him a nine and a half, yeah, just to be so. difficult. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I can say he's better than Caesar. It's it's difficult, Definitely but it, it's par. more it's more context though, because we you know we can compare them a little bit. But what Caesar was faced with was not the same as what Vespasian was faced with. It's the, it'd be the same as like you know Napoleon versus Caesar. Like they're different yeah. contexts completely. Yeah, that's fair. I'm gonna give him a ten. Yeah, I'll give him a ten. There it is. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that is a perfect 20 for Vespasian under Mastery of Military Might. And on to the next. Mm -hmm. Terrible tyranny. All right, so how terrible or tyrannical was Vespasian? So 
Another quote from Suetonius. There is no evidence of any innocent person being punished during his reign. And then Suetonius goes on to say, unless someone did it behind his back and he wasn't there. Okay. Which, well. okay, sure. And another quote, Vespasian certainly never rejoiced at any man's death, but rather sighed and wept over the mm-hmm. sufferings of those who deserved punishment. Um, it's important to note that Suetonius is surprisingly nice to Vespasian compared to all the other emperors he writes about. It's kind of strange. Interesting. Yeah. He's a little too nice to him for some historians liking. Yeah. It almost seems like maybe he wasn't. The maybe one. it was a little. Yeah. But anyway, he did overthrow an emperor, mm-hmm. which is kind of tyrannical. However, one could argue that he was honor bound to defend Galba's throne from usurpation. Sure. Because he had sworn allegiance to Galba. Yeah. And then Vitellius went, you know, mm-hmm. tried to overthrow him, but just got there too late. Right. And so, then overthrew the next one. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he also, like Augustus, certainly comes out of the Civil War looking the best. For sure. You know, just you won and then things were better. So yeah. you certainly look like the good guy. Right. Um, he, as I said, was said to be very money hungry. Uh, he levied high taxes against many provinces. He was not above selling a position to someone with enough coin. Uh, he could even be bribed by criminals to forget their offenses. <laughs> Some might claim he had to do these things to get the treasury uh, not empty. Sure. Um, after Nero and the two civil wars. But he was apparently criticized in his day for being greedy. So it seems likely that that was just mm-hmm. kind of who he was. One story often told about Vespasian is that he was taxing everything even the urinals how dare you tax someone to go to the bathroom that's like some real anarchy roller coaster tycoon stuff right there (laughs) good reference good reference (laughs) i looked into this because i I went my first thought was how yeah how do you tax in those doorman on there right (laughs) right on these massive communal bathrooms how do you do that and what i found was that it's not really what it sounds like okay uh, the, he did tax urine, but not using a bathroom. So Romans used urine to get ammonia oh, for many okay. things like okay. teeth whitening Wonderful. and laundry like and that. cotton. I'm going to wash. Okay. Yeah. Well. So the story goes because Suetonius says he put a tax on public urinals. Mm-hmm. What it was was a tax on pe- companies buying using the urine. urine. Okay to to yeah so that makes sense and i couldn't you know it's one of those things that really bugged me because i saw conflicting things yeah um where you know a lot of people mentioned the urine tax Mm -hmm. and then if you look deeper into it it's like ah, it's not really that Mm -hmm. history's weird man it's really hard to know the truth from the fact from the fiction yeah interpretation stuff different context points of view right very difficult but anyway he he did this and uh so titus uh, what whatever this tax actually was titus apparently like confronted him mm-hmm. and was like dude you can't you okay. this is beneath us okay gotcha. why are you doing that and then he held up a vespasian held up a coin and he said smell it does it smell any different oh and yet it <laughs> came from piss well, yeah I- so you know and he's very witty yeah i mean <laughs> you'll, like, see, you're not wrong. you'll see that he's quite witty so so there's that he may have taxed urinals but it seemed more likely that he was just taxing the use of urine right which is kind things. of a business thing anyways so. right um he was tough on the soldiers but mm-hmm. not brutally so uh, many of the sources we use for the early roman empire lived during vespasian's reign Okay. Suetonius was alive during this time. He wasn't writing during this right, time, but, but he was, was alive. alive. As I said, Suetonius speaks very highly of Vespasian, while most of the others, he's at least he's harsh or at least uh, like honest mm-hmm. about them. And Vespasian's propaganda campaign might have carried over into the modern day. Okay, where he he's just yeah. made himself look good. There's just yeah too much positive to go back on. Right, but one would imagine that if he was horrible, we would have at least heard about it. Yeah. So this one's kind of tough. I'm thinking one or two. I was gonna say, I was gonna say two, I guess, but I definitely could be one. Because I mean, you were like overthrew an emperor. I'm like, yeah, but uh, not. Yeah. Re- I mean, not really. He didn't decide. He didn't just up and go. You know what? I'm gonna yeah. overthrow. There was definitely. It was the time for it. Right. I'll give him. I'll give him a two. I'll okay. just give him a two. Uh, I'll yeah. give him a. Yeah, I'll give him a two as well. You know what's crazy? 
he is the first emperor to not have double digit terrible tyranny. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. So the next lowest is Caesar. That makes sense. Who who had uh thirteen? Yeah, and he got four. Yeah, so good good on you, Vespasian. You're gonna have yeah, a lower seems score, like a but genuine dude. But for a good reason. Lives of the living. All right, so lives of the living. How good were the lives of their subjects? So I I kind of have quotes on quotes here because mm-hmm. there's there's some good ones. So Chris Scar from the Chronicle of the Roman Emperors said, Vespasian was a new kind of Roman emperor middle class rather than patrician Mm -hmm. and a man with wide experience in the provinces and the army. Mm -hmm. This is what you were talking about rather than a mere urban courtier. He gave the empire a period of stable and efficient government after the disturbances of the year 69, his tolerance and humor won him friends and his conscientious attention to the welfare of Rome and the provinces set the empire on a new and firmer footing. Suetonius says Rome was disfigured by fire damaged and collapsed buildings. Mm -hmm. So Vespasian allowed anyone who wished to take over vacant sites and build on them. If the owners failed to do so. Fair. So that's a pretty good way to fix up the city. Another quote. He also undertook new public works, the temple of peace near the forum, the completion of a shrine of Claudius, the God. Remember uh, Claudius, like most emperors was deified. Right. And once they're deified, you need a temple. Yeah. But Nero couldn't be bothered. So it got almost completely destroyed once Nero came to power. Yeah. So that was begun by Agrippina, but was dismantled under Nero. I already said Mm -hmm, that. mm -hmm. And the amphitheater, which we know as the Colosseum. Right. So that was actually completed by Titus, but it was started by Vespasian at the heart of the city, a project which he knew Augustus had cherished. So he's doing a lot of good stuff. Along with the Colosseum, he took the giant statue of Nero. Mm Mm-hmm and uh remove the head oh okay and put the sun god apollo's head on it all right well why waste a perfectly good statue and and this colossal statue is why we call the Colosseum the Colosseum, colossus oh okay yeah that makes sense mm-hmm. he was very forgiving after the war mm-hmm. like i said he kicked out soldiers who supported vitellius but he didn't execute a bunch of them yeah. uh he even helped vitellius's daughter find a husband and paid her dowry oh, how nice yeah uh he's not one to hold a grudge mm-hmm he was very modest and had a great sense of humor, not above self-deprecation. Okay. Uh, people could make fun of him. <laughs> Perfect. People called him greedy. At his funeral, they even made jokes about it. Like, Good. He knew. Yeah. Like, uh, when he grew tired during his triumphal procession, he said, serves me right for wanting a triumph at my age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. So he's a funny guy. Uh, he reestablished the social hierarchy that was getting a bit loose under Nero. Okay. Senators had superiority uh, superiority over equestrian knights, and remember that uh, Otho was equestrian. Mm-hmm. So you know, just making sure, and that was important. It sounds bad to us, but that was important to their right. society. Now there was a huge backlog of lawsuits and court cases caused by the government turmoil of the past few years, right? As one might expect, Vespasian set up a randomly selected group of senators and knights and formed a commission to oversee more cases and unjam the system, which was very successful. He also ended the civil war before it could ruin the empire. Pretty good. Yes. Few cons that I have. Mm -hmm. He made a new law that any woman who got romantically or physically involved with a slave would herself become a slave. Okay. Mm, Not the same if you're a man because (laughs) that difference is... Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just the time. (laughs) Yeah. History Uh, sucks. His taxes were heavy. But they kind of had to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to him, at the beginning of his reign, the state was 40 billion sesterces in debt. That's a lot. Yeah, a lot. But he was very open about the spending he was doing. Mm-hmm. The people could see that he was rebuilding Rome and fixing the economy. So yeah. he was greedy, but not so bad as like, I want all the money for me. Yeah, I'm sure that helped the light of it. The right. People probably felt a little less bad. For sure. So that's what I've got for the lives of the living. I think, you know, when you look at the way things had been going, mm-hmm. he definitely righted the ship. Yeah. It was it was sure. going poorly. <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. Yeah. yeah. And he uh, he made it go pretty well for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thinking like seven or eight territory, honestly. Okay. Okay. Really, I... Really pulling it out of the ashes. Mm-hmm. I was thinking nine. Okay. Because to, to have such a 180... From mm-hmm. from Nero and the year of the four emperors to stability, yeah, and comfort. That's true. And all the revolts were done. That's true. And there's not much about his actual reign, so right? It had to be pretty good, right? 
it just had to be chill. Yeah. Because otherwise we would have probably. Well, heard I'll more. go with a nine then. Okay. Yeah. I'll match you with a nine, which yeah. puts him uh, joint first place in this category with Augustus. Augustus, yeah. Yep. So well done, Vespasian. Yeah, you were doing maybe. very well. You did a good job. Yeah. On to the next. Departing demise. How he died. Mm -hmm. Let's look. In 79 CE, he was out of Rome, just kind of chilling. Yeah. You know, living his life. Uh, he became ill and <gasps> so headed back to his summer home. He's an old man, though, right? Because yeah. he was 60 when he started. So he's probably what, early 70s now. Getting there. Yeah. You'll see. There, he drank from the local spring, which only made it worse. Bad idea. <laughs> he started suffering horrible diarrhea. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> and was losing strength fast. Yeah. He continued administering the empire from his bed for oh. a while, even as he grew more and more depleted. Mm -hmm. His mind did not seem to fail him, though. In his usual witty way, he proclaimed, Dear me, I think I'm becoming a god. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's ready to be God. deified, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, as the time drew near, he requested that his servants and family members help him to stand, and he proclaimed, an emperor ought to die standing. And as he attempted to rise, his life gave out, and well, he died at the age of 69. There you go. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> I, I have nice in yeah. my notes, <laughs> just in case. He was laid to rest in the mausoleum of Augustus with mm. the Julio-Claudians. So it shows the the reverence for yeah. which people held him. Uh, his son Titus, ever his right hand man, was immediately declared emperor. Makes sense. And the Flavian dynasty carried onward. Yeah. So he died of natural causes or illness, yeah. which we've discussed is rare. Mm -hmm. And he also had two good last ish words, like some great <laughs> phrases that yeah. follow with us. And I really like the idea of him being like, "I'm not going to die in this bed. I'm an emperor. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to stand up." That's true. So. I want to give him like somewhere eight, nine, ten territory because I just really find his death entertaining. That's yeah. What are you fair. thinking? I'm thinking more like seven okay. because that's fair. He's just entertaining, <laughs> right? Right, <laughs> and that's just why it's entertaining. Okay, yeah. I can I can get on board with this. Okay, you're gonna go for seven. Mm -hmm. I might go for eight. Yeah, I think I'm going to go for eight because I do really enjoy. No, because like assassinations and stuff. Right. Yeah. Well, so Nero got an eight and a seven. Is his death more entertaining than Nero? No, it's not. Okay, we'll both go for seven. Okay. <laughs> we'll do that comparison. So well done getting a 14 on Departing Demise. And our last section before we decide the big question, let's go on to Lasting Legacy. Lasting Legacy. Okay. So we're past most of the really famous emperors that mm -hmm. people will probably know. There's a couple, like you probably know Marcus Aurelius, yeah. Commodus because of the movie, mm -hmm. and you've heard of a few others. But the really famous ones are the first five, mm -hmm. and now we're past that. Now, Vespasian's someone you've never heard of, I'm sure. Nope. And the average person hasn't. I hadn't heard of him before I started really getting into Rome. But his rule certainly saved the empire. Mm -hmm. It could have fallen apart. For sure. While dealing with the fire damage, Suetonius tells us that, quote, he undertook to restore or replace the 3,000 bronze tablets from the temple, which had been damaged or lost, initiating a thorough search for copies of these venerable and beautifully executed records of government, state decrees, and acts of, com of the commons, dating back to to the city's foundation dealing with treaties alliances and privileges granted to individuals so he put an effort to save history mm -hmm. and make sure that it didn't get lost from Which the kind of rare it's and, and great really important yeah and you know for a legacy like yeah you won't be like remembered and revered for that but it's very important mm -hmm. the great jewish revolt and the destruction of jerusalem was a major turning point for the jewish people they were kicked out after this so, the Jews, just in general? Yeah. Okay. And uh, this was the first time they were truly punished. Mm -hmm. Not so much for their faith, but kind of for their faith. Right. It was It was more like, oh, you pesky Jews, not so much, oh, you pesky religious people. Right. It was more, yeah. Yeah, but still, it was bad. This ended many divisions in Judaism. Judaism. Mm. So there used to be a lot of groups, you know, mm -hmm. like how uh, Islam has Sunni and Shiite yep. and things like that. There were groups like that in Judaism. And after that, after the war, you don't hear about them anymore. 
they kind of all came together, you know, common enemy. Makes kind of sense, thing. yeah. Right. <laughs> so it was a big thing for the Jews. The leaders of the Jews worked hard to preserve their scripture and traditions mm-hmm. in an ever more hostile world. Next, he helped keep the Pax Romana alive, the okay. Roman peace. So the year of the four emperors was the only time between Augustus and Marcus Aurelius, 200 years, where civil war broke out in the empire. Okay. That's what the Pax Romana is, is mm-hmm. internal peace. And he brought an end to it like that. Mm-hmm. Very quickly, it was over. Civil wars often lead to more civil wars. Yeah. And for this tumultuous year to lead to a new solid dynasty is nothing short of spectacular. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that, he started a new dynasty. Right. The second Roman dynasty. The Flavians uh, don't last that long. <laughs> They would only rule from 69 to 96 CE. And to jump ahead a bit, because it is kind of important, this dynasty leads to the era known as the five good emperors, or as I call it, Nerva plus the four good emperors. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We'll learn about that. That that can be partially attributed to his sons Mm -hmm. who go on to succeed him, but he, he started it. Yeah. Interesting, just kind of a, a, a thing. We often think of kingdoms being handed down to the eldest son, mm-hmm. right? It's just how it mm-hmm. is in our understanding. Vespasian is the ninth emperor, and he is the first to have his biological son succeed him. To be fair, they had tried before. Yeah. Circumstances just didn't allow. Yeah, the family <laughs> tree of just dead everyone. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, actually, let's see. So, Augustus never had a son. Tiberius had a son who died before him. Mm -hmm. And then Caligula didn't have any kids. Claudius had a son who was supposed to become, but he let Nero become. Yeah, so there was only a couple that were really even close. So, yeah, lasting legacy. Oh, and uh, he built the Colosseum, which is still around and is one of the most famous Mm -hmm. Roman things. Mm -hmm. Titus often gets credit for it because it finished in his finished reign his but it's still i would give it i would give credit to vespasian so this one <laughs> lasting legacy i would give him probably another seven yeah i was thinking seven because i've never heard of the man but and i don't know that that matters moving forward because That's, yeah so sometimes it's more like the legacy left behind not so much they're remembering them mm-hmm. you know but uh, yeah, because because a lot of them you won't have heard of. Yeah, but yeah. So you think seven? Yeah. I'll give him wow, seven. we 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 matched Solid on all seven. of our things here. So let's sum this up here. Ooh, interesting. All right. So he got a score of seventy. Okay. Which yeah. is it's fair. The reason that it's low is because he wasn't a tyrant. Right. Yeah. He didn't just murder random people. Yeah. Everything else was pretty significant. Mm-hmm. Uh. He got, you know, perfect score on Mastery of Military Might, almost mm-hmm. perfect on li- Lives of the Living, which means he, like, could kick ass and rule well. That's right. basically what that meant. Yeah. So, good job on you. So, now, we have one final question. The Great? All right. So, does he deserve to be called the Great? I would argue, yeah. Okay. Just because, you, I mean, he brought the Empire out of turmoil and really stabilize it real quick. Yeah. It's, th- and then led to more prosperity. For a long time yeah. to come. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I think he, mm-hmm. he really was the savior. And this I, I was not sure how you were going to feel about it. So we were I was I was asking you before this, right. what do we do if we disagree? Because mm-hmm. I'm also of the opinion that yes, yeah, he does I deserve so. the great. So we'll 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 leave that question for when it comes yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we can also give him a title. For mm-hmm. fun. Yeah. I have a quote from Chris Scar from the uh, Chronicle of the Roman Emperors that I think sums him up well. The impression we are left with is of a man of firm, though limited, of limited objectives, conscientious and generally tolerant, not one to harbor a grudge or imagine enemies around every corner. He was, in that sense, one of the good emperors of Rome. So I was thinking Vespasian the Good. Mm-hmm. Or just because it's fun, Vespasian the Flavian. <laughs> no, that's just his name. That's just his family name. <laughs> um, I also alluded to my like comparison to Caesar. So I was thinking Vespasian the good Caesar. Mm. Or, I mean, you already said the savior. 
that's also so you think the savior fitting. i was thinking i didn't write it on my list but mm-hmm. that is one that i had in my head so i'm okay with that um the new augustus which is also kind of a play um because he is the founder of a new dynasty the yeah. new emperor yeah yeah so what do you think i think the savior and the good are both very fitting yep i agree not sure which one i like more i don't either yeah the stabilizer yep I mean, little little on the head there they're all just yeah they're all just <laughs> accurate they're just good yeah hmm savior sounds better than good i think vespasian the savior yeah 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 okay so we're gonna go with vespasian the savior also worthy of the title mm-hmm. the great mm-hmm. first one since augustus yeah but it in fairness like we knew or i knew yeah that, that <laughs> yeah. the last yeah. two yeah. were not gonna get it because right. they're just interesting all right well great episode thank you guys so much for listening um i want to because i keep forgetting to do it thank you to totalis rankium they have podcasts on all of the roman emperors and they're working their way through the american presidents Mm -hmm, so if you mm -hmm. want in-depth on the three emperors that i kind of glossed over throughout this they have hour and a half episodes on each of them so Mm -hmm. go check that out um they were the inspiration for this podcast uh and a rex factor inspired them so this format is now like 12 years old and i'm just hopping on it (laughs) But uh, I think this, on it somehow. Right. I think this is the point where we babble until the music plays and we are done for the day and we'll, we'll yeah. see y'all next time. What a day it's been. It, oh yeah, it's been it's a long Tuesday. Day. It's just been. I woke up to rain on my bed. Falling apart. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. The rest of the week's been long.